Today on Across the Fence, we'll be visiting the tropics at the University of Vermont Greenhouse. It's a wonderful place to get inspiration and education and is open to the public. Hi, I'm Leonard Perry with University of Vermont Extension. Here at the Greenhouse, we'll be taking a look at some of the high-tech controls that run this operation. We'll look at some of the unusual plants. We'll learn how they control the pests here with the safest biocontrol agents and we'll get a glimpse of some of the current research here. With me to give us this overview of all these is Greenhouse Manager Colleen Armstrong. Thanks so much, Colleen, for You're spending welcome. a little time with us today. Excellent. So I understand this is also um, a little milestone here at the Greenhouse. It's the 25th year. It is. So could you tell us, one, a little bit about the Greenhouse, what's here, and also what you've seen over those years? So the Greenhouse was built in 1991, and we have a glass structure gutter connected. Um, there's 11 compartments that are used for research and teaching. And it is still one of the finest greenhouses in Vermont. And what makes it that? Primarily, it is using the integrated environmental control system to coordinate all of the equipment inside of each of the compartments. So each compartment can have a separate environment different temperature regime, relative humidity, light control, all of those factors are fitted into that integrated control system. Oh great, well that's a good segue into that. Could you tell us a little bit how this high-tech structure works? I know there's, you know, it controls a lot of things here. What, how does it work and what's it control? Okay, uh, so we have a lot of equipment that comes on and off, vents and heaters and fans. And that equipment um, is monitored with a sensor in each room. And that information goes to a computer system. And by programming, you're able to turn the equipment on and off as needed. You're able to design each room to have its separate day and night cycle. You might use it for something like diff to be able to have a separate cycle um, within that day. And that means basically, um, what, what is the diff again? Diff is, that? instead of using a chemical um, plant growth regulator, you are using the environment to be able to make a compact plant. So basically by, it, as I understand it, dropping that temperature a little bit in the, morning, the morning, even colder, but just not for too long. But it's amazing right. how something like that can it control is. growth. It is. It's pretty phenomenal, especially in the spring. We use it a lot. Yeah. Um, so that information um, is then uh, communicated to a series of panels um, where you have different voltages um, and different signals that are turning equipment on and off. We, in the upgrade, needed to separate uh, equipment run by emergency power to what is normally run. And it was an opportunity to choose a vendor, and it is Argus in our case, that has a very sophisticated and detailed software um, to be able to not only control the greenhouses, but have a lot more energy efficiency in terms of how you use your lights, your vents, your heating so system. Basically the computer program figures out what's the most energy efficient and that's going to save energy in the long run. Absolutely. Yeah, whether it's hot water for heating, whether it is vents opening and closing, all of that is tied into a really sophisticated and system. And I know you have some shade curtains too that are not just for shade, but I guess that's for energy as that, well. Exactly. So that's part of the equipment. So it's a, the curtains do provide 50% shade, which really helps for cooling in the summertime. But the thermal cover in the wintertime, it, is, it serves that purpose too. So it reduces the ceiling to be heated in the greenhouse and saves about 20% of your heating costs in the wintertime. Oh, just keeping that heat down with the plants. Just, well, yep. no, you've got a lot of tropicals and that's important for those to have that heat here, not up in the roof. So Absolutely. let's uh, start thinking about, tell us about some of these plants you have here ah. that are kind of special and they've got a lot, Lots of mountain. Do you have any feel for how many plants you have? Over we us? do. We actually have spent a lot of time developing our accession database, and we have about 450 different plants between the corridor and the first and second conservatory. 
The second, second room really uh, models a temperate rainforest, uh, thinking about like high elevation in Costa Rica. So you have a lot of different ferns. You have a lot of plants in the ginger family, jesneriids, um, some palms, all of um, legumes, all of those are unlike what we think of in terms of those families here in a temperate climate. They're much more floriferous and um, have a lot of interesting characteristics for their leaves as well. Are there some uh, kind of special you'd like to mention that you have? Well, we have uh, right now coffee beans and coffee flowers on a fairly good sized coffee tree. We have chocolate with big swollen pods. Uh, and so what, what, the chocolate comes from inside the inside pod? Inside the pod, exactly. Uh, you have that really soft, squishy, white uh, oil surrounding the pods, and then you harvest the little um, seeds inside of those pods. Well, they're not little, actually. They're pretty substantial. Um, and then you roast them as you would uh, for normal chocolate, and then mm -hmm. you're able to harvest the nib, which is a part of that seed which is the, the real chocolate. Wow, so you've got the pod surrounded, surrounded by the, the seeds, oils, and then yep, that, and the you nib, harvest part the of the seed, and that's what you yeah. actually harvest and grind up to make the chocolate powder, that's right. so amazing. Yep. It have is. you made chocolate before here? We have, we have, we have. We are not entirely successful. It's a good thing we have other chocolate <laughs> producers here, um, but it was fun to give it a whirl. What about flowering plants? I saw one in there that looked kind of like a, uh, powder puff plant. We do. We have the uh, powder puff and it is in the legume family. It's in the bean family, which you wouldn't think is being that ornamental, but um, it has these very, very uh, thin flower petals and stamens and pistils that make it look like a, just a pretty little pink powder puff. It's pot. funny because you wouldn't think about it. It looks nothing like a bean flower. So nothing. It, nothing. Which is amazing. And it's, that's a very <laughs> big family with three suborders and uh, lots in the of variation tropics. in other words lots <laughs> of variation exactly acacia is in that family you know and we think of that in terms of you know the little um, domitia where uh, ants live to be able to protect the plant wow. so there's an amazing a lot amount. of interaction with the insects and, the, and yes. the plants one plant i saw in there i know the jewel orchid that i actually had way back in college and it, it's great. I've, and I've had it for many years, different plants, and I've found it's very easy and it's uh, being terrestrial. In other words, grow, unlike a lot of orchids, it grows in a pot, which I thought was pretty neat. I give you a lot of credit. Not all students actually will grow things in their dorms, but I have noticed a trend here at UVM that more and more students want something a little green in their dorm, or maybe several plants in the no, dorm. No, no, uh, you mentioned the coffee. A lot of the students get a coffee plant here. They do. All incoming first year students can have a small coffee plant that we grow here during the summertime. Well, with all this diversity of plants, I know insects must love that, and you use some pretty special techniques. Can you tell us briefly about those? We do. It, we have a strong integrated pest management program that really uh, focuses on using natural enemies for controlling pests. We have an advantage here because it is a heated, uh, light environment. So we're able to use some insects that you might not, or mites, or uh, microbial pathogens that you may not be able to use outdoors in the field. Uh, we use a lot of predatory mites for two-spotted spider mite control and also for thrips control. We use predaceous um, beetles to feed on mealybug. And we also have parasitic wasps that are used for aphid control, whitefly control. We have mites that feed on fungus gnat larvae. All of those um, make a system that is less dependent upon using chemical control. And that is our goal, is to reduce as much of the chemical application as we can. I know in a public space like this, you really can't use most chemicals because it's, it's used so much. And that is true. So we use what they term biorational pesticides, which might be termed soft pesticides. So they, hate, they do not last long. They're compatible with many of the natural enemies that we release into the greenhouse, and it makes a much healthier environment. Well, that's amazing. It just sounds like a 
I guess if you get down on the microscope with the magnifier, a real bug eat bug world out there. It, <laughs> it must is. be it's, really something it's to see. It's fantastic that. to watch. I mean, it's what little boys and girls like to watch when they watch sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> and you um, get shipments in regularly of the, we do. all these we different ones. We get shipments ones. in every other week. And um, some of them we will use prophylactically, and others we address a problem that we have seen because we've been scouting or monitoring and the And you see an issue, so you need to order, whereas others you know you're probably going to have certain pests. Exactly. So you just keep getting them in to That's right. prevent any outbreaks. Without a doubt. So yeah. spring, you know, it's such a fast growing season. So often you have fungus gnat and aphid problems and spider mite problems. So you can really plan for that. Well, the other problem I know is sprays, they're good on some plants, so they'll injure other plants. So in this way, you don't have to worry about all that either. That's true. The phytotoxicity, if That's you will. That's right. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and also you've got, um, you mentioned earlier, tell us a little bit you know, over 25 years, you may have seen some changes in um, use of the greenhouse, uh, teaching, research. Could you mention a bit about? Yeah, it, it has. Um, ideally, you know, we wanted 50% teaching, 50% uh, research, and that varies over time. But a lot of the research um, was very was targeted in applied sciences, and I think it has changed that we see a lot more research going on in both the microbial and molecular um, plant biology, and they will also in evolutionary biology, probably the strongest, mm -hmm. so that we're looking at plants to be able to discern some of the past history of the plant. And an example I can think of is with um, invasive species, and another is to determine long ago how did the flowering plant structure evolve? What came first? Was it the leaf? Was it the root? Was it the flower? And uh, Jill Preston in plant biology is someone who's looking at that. So what are some examples of some of the research going on here? Okay. Um, we have uh, Yolanda Chen from Plant and Soil Science, and she's working on swede midge. And swede midge is a problem for organic growers who are growing broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, in that whole brassica group, um, this little fly midge destroys the terminal bud. And if you're not spraying, you need to find alternative methods. And so she has a group of graduate students that are addressing that. They're looking uh, for alternative methods other than they spraying. They are. They are. Uh, they're looking at um, timing. They're looking at um, some companion planting. Uh, and various other ones that are just being developed right now. We also have a young student, a uh, graduate student, who is looking at Bokashi, which is a fermented um, product that is a fermented compost that is inoculated in an anaerobic system, and it um, is used evidently in all over the world to be able to release nutrients faster than if you did not have that inoculum in it. Um, so it's a way of increasing your nutrient um, fertilization program. And occasionally you see something that looks like weeds in the greenhouse. I assume that's research too. We, we do. Um, the nap weed is worth uh, Jane Malofsky. She is working on an invasive species project. Uh, there are two uh, species of nap weed, which is in the Centauria genus that we find, and there is a hybrid that crosses between those two species, which if, the hypothesis is that the hybrid is more vigorous than the two as an invasive species, and that is what she's starting to direct her research towards. Well, that's a lot of exciting research. Sounds like very useful uh, opportunities for teaching, a lot of plants. How can people find out more? And I mentioned it's open to the public. How can they find out it your is. hours? We are open to the public Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4.30. Unfortunately, we're not open on the weekends, but people can visit our website, and um, the website is uvm.edu tilde forward slash greenhouse spelled G-R-N-H-O-U-S-E. Um, or they can also uh, look at, for us on Facebook, um, and that is under UVM Greenhouse Facilities all one word. 
um, those are two ways that they can Great. easily find Or they us. can just go to UVM and, uh, or just probably go to Actually, if they <laughs> search greenhouse, we, we will pop up. That's Great. A, that's another way. Well, thank way. you so much, Colleen, for all your time here today, this great overview. You're welcome, Leonard. Come back anytime. I plan to. And thank you for watching today on Across the Fence for University of Vermont Extension. I'm Leonard Perry. Oh.